Spider-Man's Last Stand is a Marvel Knights storyline, which is kind of out of continuity, kind of in continuity. Either way, just consider it a fun Spider-Man story in which he battles against the entire Sinister Six. This is the comic story in general, where I take some of your favorite comic books, I break them down into digestible bites, and I read them back to you as an audio drama. So I hope you guys enjoy, let's get into the story today. As the rain falls in the busy streets of New York, everyone hurries along to try and get to their jobs. It was just a normal day, until two diner workers go out to take the trash and they find Spider-Man lying lifeless with the garbage. The first man stares, stating, great, now they're gonna have to call the cops again for another psycho sleeping in the trash. The second man comes out and as he listens, he asks if that guy's trying to say something under the mask. Spider-Man weakly tells the two of them to get back into the store. The first man asks, what? And then another voice from nowhere says, I'm pretty sure Spider-Man's trying to warn you about something. Just then the green goblin floats down throwing pumpkin bombs and Spider-Man jumps up grabbing the men, throwing them away from the blast. Green Goblin flies his glider into Spider-Man telling him, take a deep breath, Parker. As they go barreling through the busy streets, Spider-Man tries to fight back, thinking Green Goblin isn't doing this for money. That would be too obvious. What he did four hours ago was hold 18 people hostage, threaten to gas them unless his demands of Spider-Man stabbing himself in the stomach with a knife were met. Naturally, Spider-Man didn't comply. And here they are now. Spider-Man punches into Green Goblin as they tumble back to the ground. And as Spider-Man looks for something to hit the Green Goblin with, a pedestrian shouts, the mailbox! Spider-Man grabs the mailbox, bashing it over Green Goblin's head. And another person in the crowd says, Ouch! As Spider-Man weds Green Goblin up, he asks, What? If I didn't knock him out, he would end up killing people. The man calls out to take it easy. He isn't judging. Just now that guy's gonna have brain damage. Another pedestrian looks down at a handful of pumpkin bombs that fell out of the Green Goblin pouch. As Spider-Man shouts, Stay away from those! Before he could get over there, the bombs begin to go off, throwing the pedestrians across the street. He runs over, asking, What is the matter with you? Why would you get close to those? But soon the city cheers turn to disgust, asking how could Spider-Man do the things that he has done? He let an innocent bystander get hurt, and he nearly killed someone with a mailbox. What kind of hero is Spider-Man? Just before the police arrive, Spider-Man sneaks away to head back to Aunt May's home, where she's packing, getting ready to move. Without his costume, Peter stumbles into the house as his wife MJ and Aunt May help clean him up. Peter Parker sits in his room telling May that he's going to miss this place. Ever since he's left, nothing's changed. May hugs him, telling him that it was a fresh start and they'll be closer together in the city. This is for the best. They both hug, across the street, a pair of eyes stare into the window. The next day, Peter receives a call from the city council that some of the kids vandalized his Uncle Ben's tombstone. He hurries down to the cemetery to see, stating that it's kind of strange that this tombstone would be targeted. It didn't have any special features or anything like that. The city worker tells him it was probably nothing personal, but as much as he hates to say it, these random occurrences are starting to become more and more frequent. Just then, Peter gets a call, and as he answers, he asks, Aunt May? The voice on the other end tells him, Not even close, Spider-Man. Nice job finally taking out the Green Goblin. Funny the news is stating that he's looking to charge Spider-Man with aggravated assault, huh? Peter says, Uh, I'm sorry, there must be some kind of a mistake. The voice tells him, Please! Let's be adults about this, Peter. Wasn't defiling your uncle's grave enough? Do we really have to do something truly awful? Peter asks, What do they want? And the voice tells him, we just want you to realize how bad things can get when something as simple as your real name falls into the wrong hands. Peter then asks, what, what are you talking about? And the voice says, care for a wheat snack, sweetie? Peter hangs up the phone, rushing over to May's new apartment without even changing into his costume, almost not caring who sees him at this point. He does, however, make sure to not stay in one spot long enough for anyone to really get a look at his face. He swings around the building, jumping through the apartment window, calling out, on May, on May! But as he looks around, he sees the apartment has been ransacked and May is nowhere to be found. After sending MJ away in fear that she may be targeted next, Peter makes a call to one of the only people who know his real identity, Black Cat. As Black Cat deals with her issues, she really can't be of any help at the moment. She's no angel, but even Black Cats know that there are certain lines you don't cross. No trying to peek under the mask and don't get people's families involved. Peter tells her that he really needs her help on this. He doesn't know where to start and having a second pair of eyes would really help. So she sighs and tells him she's in Florida dealing with a missing persons case. 
but she'll try and take the next flight back to New York. In the meantime, it might be a good idea to make a list of everyone who knows your secret identity. There's Eddie Brock, her, Aunt May, Mary Jane, and Peter then realizes it. Oh my God, Osborne. Over on Rikers Island, prisoned up with some of the most powerful supervillains. Peter puts on his costume and he asks Osborne what he's done with her. Osborne holds up his hand telling security, it would seem we have a breach. If you could send somebody to... But Peter stops him telling him, the guard is on a bathroom break. Now before this window gets kicked in, where the hell is she? Osborne tells him, you're gonna have to be a little more specific, Parker. Peter shouts asking, what have you done with Aunt May? Osborne looks up from his book telling him, now, that's interesting. And you're assuming I'm the one behind it. Well, that would mean that not just Uncle Ben's blood is on your hands, but soon you're on to May's. Not to mention that dead blonde you used to dance with. Besides, how could I have done it? You've got me locked up. That is, unless I shared your little secret with a mutual acquaintance. Surely you didn't think that I would keep this all to myself, right? I just told a friend that if Spider-Man ever threw Green Goblin in jail, he would need someone kidnapped. It's nothing personal. Just keep in mind the grisly reputation that all of the little lunatics crawling around here have. Then again, I could also be lying. Just take advantage of a good boy in a bad situation. Peter leaves telling him, lately, he can't even tell if the mask is on or off with him anymore. Osborne takes off his glasses and he looks up into the camera asking the security guard, enjoy your leak. Officer Jankowitz! With no one else to turn to, Peter makes a desperate attempt to get a hold of the Avengers. As he knocks on the door, Jarvis tells him, Sure, I'll get Captain America for you, but who's there? The amazing Spider-Man? Peter shouts, No, please don't make me do this the hard way. Just let me in so that I can explain what's going on. Jarvis tells him that he can have a good night. Hopefully our frat house boys find this to be funny when the police arrive to take you away. As the mansion guards show up, Peter kicks in the door to try and find any hero that he can. Suddenly there's a blue light as Quicksilver speeds through, knocking Peter through several walls. Before Quicksilver could punch Peter though, Captain America shows up telling him, Stand down. Let's hear what this gentleman has to say before things get out of hand. Cap helps Peter up and Peter tells him, This is gonna sound crazy, mostly because none of you know my identity, but my aunt has been kidnapped. I needed to see Fury. Cap asks, Isn't this something that we could help you with? Nick's currently in a parallel reality. Peter says, Well, since Fury already knows who I am, it makes things a little less complicated. Cap tells him, Doesn't matter if we know who you are or not, and frankly, we really don't care to know. If you need help, we'll get some information to go off of. Peter then says, It's easy for him to say, All the people he grew up with are already deceased. It's not like him going public will put his childhood sweetheart in danger. You know what? Sorry, bad idea. I'm stressed and I'm worried about my aunt. Sorry for wasting everyone's time. Cap tries to tell Peter, Wait! But Peter doesn't respond and he leaves. Now, without the heroes to turn to, Peter makes one last ditch effort to try and find Aunt May. And that means speaking with the owl. Peter easily knocks out the owl's man, and as the owl pours himself a glass of wine, he asks, What does Spider-Man want? Peter hands him a picture of Aunt May stating that there's a kidnapped victim by the name of May Parker. She was taken from her apartment less than 24 hours ago, and he has suspicions that a costume was involved. Owl tells him that this has nothing to do with him, but Peter says that it should when someone is trying to take over Kingpin's empire. That would mean that Spider-Man would owe him. For a fat little man with his eyes on becoming New York's next mob boss, this should be worth a lot. Owl takes a sip of his wine and says, Wait there while I make a few phone calls. Short while later, he returns, stating, Electro and the Vulture. Peter asks if he's sure, and the Owl says, My sources are impeccable. Peter quickly jumps out the window, stating, Thanks. And the Owl tells him, You are more than welcome. Elsewhere in the city, Vulture tells Electro that they shouldn't be doing this. They're supposed to be holed up in a hotel until the wheelman is ready to get them. Electro laughs, telling him, It's going to be fine! We just needed to get out of that place and into a bar. I know just the place. The two enter a secret underground bar, and the bouncer yells to Electro, It's good to see you again. How you been? Electro says that he's been supercharged as ever. Now him and his friend are going to go look for a good time tonight. Got anyone special for the Vulture? Vulture whispers to Electro that if he's being honest, this kind of thing is very distasteful and exploitative. Electro tells him, Vultures are supposed to be exploitative. Just shut up and have some fun for once in your life. As Electro leaves his date, she begins changing shapes into the other female superheroes, asking what he's in the mood for tonight. Sue Richards, Scarlet Witch, maybe Marina? Electro opens up the door, stating, Actually, there's something I was interested in. But as the door swings open, Electro sees the room covered in webs and Peter telling him, I'm sorry to spoil your party. 
Electra pushes the woman away, trying to shock Peter, but as Peter dodges, uh, he punches Electra, asking, Really? Do you think I'm that stupid? He tackles Electra out of the room. Vulture and his date see this, and the woman shouts, You have to do something! Vulture grabs his suitcase, telling them, It doesn't work like that. My costume is back in the hotel! As Vulture jumps out the window, Peter tells him, You're not going anywhere! And he shoots the webbing, hitting the suitcase. Electro shouts to Vulture to let go of the case, but as Vulture pulls back, the suitcase pops open with money raining down onto the streets. Electro sets off an explosion, shooting Peter out of the building, screaming, That was all the money we had, you idiot! Vulture grabs the empty suitcase, stating, Well, it's gone. The 20 million is scattered across the neighborhood. What are we going to do? Electro then tells him, We're gonna crucify that clown! No more fun and games! We're gonna tear Spider-Man apart for this! Electro jumps out chasing after Peter, but every time he gets close, Peter would punch him down. As the two land on a passing taxi, Electro sends an electrical shock through the car and into Peter. Peter manages to kick Electro back to stop him, but Electro blasts him into the air asking, What the hell? That actually hurts you, little runt! This time you've gotten yourself in way over your head! This is- this was just between bad guys! Spider-Man shouldn't have been involved! Just then, Electra begins to use his power to pick up small metal objects, and he begins to shoot them at Peter. All of the missed shots land into cars and other things, and Peter shouts for him, Stop! You could hurt someone! Electro yells, Yeah! Well, you just cost me $20 million! I'm gonna be taking it out on someone! Seconds later, the car that Peter was standing on explodes, with Peter shouting, Stop! Don't do this! Electro walks up, lifting the nearby car, is asking, Do you have any idea how pathetic you sound? When you're in prison for a long time, you find new ways to use your powers, just like... And that's when all of the cars that Electro has lifted come crashing down onto Peter, exploding, setting everyone on fire. With no sign of Spider-Man, Electro begins to escape, but Peter barrels into him from behind, throwing the two into an abandoned building. Peter doesn't say anything. He just feels his blind rage, and he punches him over and over again. Electro stumbles back, telling him, I'm gonna burn your face off! And Peter points to the sign, telling him, Gas and propane! Do you really think that's a good idea? A few moments later, the entire top of the building explodes, with Peter shouting, asking, Where's your hostage? Where is May Parker? Electro asks, What are you talking about? But before Peter could answer, Electro begins to laugh. He tells Peter, you must really be an idiot. You do know Kingpin used to be a movie producer, right? Now with Kingpin out of the way, Owl moved in to take over and hired us to try and get himself a decent gang. The truth is we've never even heard of this woman. Sounds like Owl just played you like a freaking violin. Electro shocks the water, electrocuting Peter. As he tries to recover, he ends up falling off the ledge. He tries to shoot the webbing to catch himself, but he doesn't reach it in time, falling straight into a police car. An ambulance rushes onto the scene to help those that have been hurt, and Peter is one of the ones that is taken away. The doctors lay him on a table, getting ready to operate when one of the EMTs states that they need to keep the Spider-Man mask on. The doctor, preparing for surgery, asks, What are you, nine? Hand me the scissors before this guy chokes to death because of the mask! The doctor begins to cut open the mask, tossing it into the trash, stating, Okay, now we can get to work. As the operation finishes, the media catches wind that there are 17 casualties, one of which is Spider-Man himself. The doctors are working hard to keep everyone alive. Inside of the hospital, the director tells the doctor that they do not remove the masks of super people. Because of this, every half-baked Green Goblin wannabe is going to try to make a name for himself. It's at that moment that someone bursts through the windows in Peter's room and the nurse shouts to just get back. This man doesn't even know where he is. Vulture lands at the foot of Peter's bed asking, Have you seen the Discovery Channel? This is what vultures do! Vulture then grabs the woman, snapping her neck, telling Peter, It's time for us to get down to business. But before we do, I just want to take a peek under all those bandages to see who I've been fighting all these years. Peter reaches out for a pitcher of water, slamming it against the vulture's head, knocking him back long enough to let security make their way in. Security opens fire, but Vulture quickly grabs Peter to use him as a shield, causing him to get shot twice. He then turns around, lifting Peter up, flying through the window, and he begins to fly up as high as he can into the sky. Vulture starts shouting, Do you know what I was going to do with that money? I was going to give it to my damn grandson. My grandson has leukemia, and now he won't get the treatment. Now we're going to take off these stupid bandages and see exactly who you are. Vulture begins to pull the last bit of the bandages away, looking at Peter's face, and he tells him he can't believe it. All of his friends were put away. All of them were put away by a nobody. All these years getting beaten by a nobody. 
He releases Peter to let him fall, but as Peter starts to shoot webbing to catch himself, he realizes his web shooters are gone. That's when Black Cat swings by grabbing him, throwing him up onto the ledge. Vulture rockets towards them shouting, no, 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 and he tackles straight into Black Cat. He picks her up, sending her through a building, but before falling, she throws her grappling hook, latching it onto Vulture's leg. She pulls back on the cord, swiping at Vulture's chest, drawing blood. Vulture shouts that she should know that this suit makes him more powerful. And Black Cat tells him, oh, she knows. Let's see how good he can fly without a navigation system. She pulls back on the Vulture's wings, guiding him headfirst into a billboard before jumping off at the last second. As the Vulture falls onto the roof, Black Cat lands on him, stating, if you ever touch my ex again, I will kill you. Later, at the meatpacking district of Manhattan, Owl sips his tea, telling a tied up Electro that it would be best if he didn't try to move. The doctor here has just injected him with a special kind of drug that neutralizes all those nasty little shocks. In fact, the only thing he's gonna feel is pain. Now admit it, admit what he did was wrong and accept punishment for it. Electro shouts, it wasn't him, it was the vulture. Just let me go and we can both find the crooked old goat. Owl asks, like you were gonna find my $20 million? I don't think so. Besides, Black Cat already found the vulture and dropped him off earlier. She was going to search while in Florida, so it would stand to reason that she's not in the best of moods when she caught up with Vulture here. Electro asks, what does he mean? And Owl tells the doctor to remove the blanket. The sheet comes off and the Vulture gasps for air, his face and body covered in deep cuts and bruises. Electro shouts, oh God, Vulture! Jesus, God, no! The doctor then holds up a scalpel to Electro's face, and Owl takes a sip of his tea. To wit too, Mr. Dillon, to wit too. Everyone knows the people who wait in the airports, and they hold up signs to the people that they're waiting for. At JFK International, it's no different. Except there is one slight difference, because one man is holding up a sign for Venom. Eddie Brock walks through the crowd asking if it's supposed to be some kind of a joke. Are you trying to upset him? The man nervously says, No, Mr. Brock, it's just that the employer said that your name is still a secret. Eddie sighs, telling him, shut up and call whoever's funding this, telling him I need strawberries, champagne, and a sweet sprinkled with rose petals. No sense in making my last days on Earth any more unpleasant than they need to be, right? Meanwhile, across town at Spider-Man's apartment, Mary Jane returns despite Spider-Man telling her not to come back, only to throw away a stack of final notice bills. As she looks at them, Black Cat shouts in the other room, Spider-Man just woke up screaming. She rushes over and as Black Cat looks at the bruised and broken Spider-Man, Peter says, what are you doing here? Black Cat tells him that he was fighting with the Vulture and he may have dropped him out of the sky, but she made sure to get everything taken care of. Spider-Man shakes his head asking, how long have I been out? And Mary Jane tells him it's been two and a half days. He then shouts asking, what, what about Aunt May? Have there been any messages from the kidnapper? And Aunt May tells him, no, nothing's happened since you've been unconscious. Black Cat says, actually, there's one thing and hands over the morning's newspaper. Spider-Man reads the headline, Spider-Man Unmasked, and he sees a photo of him with his mask torn when he was brought to the hospital. Black Cat tells him it's okay, they didn't see his actual face, but J. Jonah Jameson is offering $5 million to anyone able to identify you. Black Cat then gets up stating, I have to run out and meet with someone. He knows everything around this town, so if anything comes up, I'll make sure to let you know, Peter. Mary Jane waves, telling her to be careful, and Black Cat says to make sure that she looks after their friend there. If he gives her any crap about going on patrol, just call. After a bit, Spider-Man gets up to eat when Mary Jane sits with him and asks, so when is he gonna start calling it quits? One of the first things he promised is if things got out of control, he would call the police and admit who he is. Going public would make things easier to find Aunt May. Spider-Man says that they can't, not now at least. This is what happens when one psychopath knows who I am. Going public would invite the rest of the lunatics. Mary Jane grabs a folder, stating if that's the case, they need to start looking at someone who knows who he is, starting with Osborne. Spider-Man slips through the papers, telling her no. Norman was my first choice, but he's been in police custody since Aunt May has been taken. Besides, that just wouldn't add up. Norman's known my identity for years, and he's never pulled a stunt like this. This is the work of someone who just found out. Mary Jane asks, what about Venom? He is someone that we should look. And at that moment, the phone rings and Spider-Man answers. The woman on the line says that it's compact card credit, and they're calling to understand why he's been late on his payments. Spider-Man asks, what is she talking about? The bank automatically pulls all their credit card bills. There's plenty of money in the account. And the woman tells him that that's something he would have to talk to the bank about. So he hangs up shouting, believe me, I will. He looks back at Mary Jane and sees her crying, asking what's wrong. And she says, Peter, we have to have a serious talk. 
The two walk through the park and Mary Jane says that she didn't want to burden him with these things. She's supposed to take care of the little things and now they're in this mess. Spider-Man shrugs, stating they'll just have to sell a few original photos again. It's no big deal. They've been without money before. Everything's gonna be fine. We've gotten through worse situations. She lays his head on his shoulder, telling him that he's already got so much on his plate, but he tells her, you married a superhero, remember? Things will be fine. Later that night, Spider-Man heads out on patrol, even though he's still recovering, when his spider sense goes off. He hurries over downtown to find Doc Ock rampaging through the city like an uncontrollable madman. He swings down to pull two people out of the way of a thrown car and then webs up Doc Ock's face. He then punches into Doc Ock, telling himself that this isn't something Otto Octavius would do. Mindless rampage? It doesn't fit. Maybe a drug thing? With one final punch, Spider-Man knocks Doc Ock across the street into a bus, and then he gets ready to snap a few pictures when he notices something. Doc Ock has several trank darts shot into his back. Before he could even ask what's going on, the New York SWAT team surrounds him, telling him to stand back or they will open fire. All of the officers inch closer, and Spider-Man asks, Are you out of your minds? I was the one who took the guy down. What the hell did you do? One of the officers tells him, We shot him full of tranquilizers when he broke loose from the convoy. Would have been fine without you. So Spider-Man asks, what the hell are you even doing taking Doc Ock away from the prison anyway? And the officer tells him, the good doctor had a few tests he had to get to. And that's the least of your issues right now. Once the officers are close enough, Spider-Man's spider sense begins to go off and he says, this is about the reward, isn't it? One officer grabs him, telling him, we're tired of cleaning up your mess. Let's just say there's a little bonus money if we unmask you. Spider-Man pushes the officer off, telling him, don't be stupid. And all of the officers pile on trying to tear at his mask. Just before the officers can get his mask off, Spider-Man throws the group of officers into the air and one of the officers shouts, asking, what are we waiting for? Take him down. All of the officers then open fire with the captain running out screaming, what the hell are you doing? The officer tells him that Spider-Man is resisting arrest. We're gonna need air support or we're gonna lose this punk. The captain tells everyone to stand down. Do you think I don't read the newspapers? Get Dr. Octopus back to the truck and be glad I'm not filing a report on this. Later at the Daily Bugle, security drags a man out of J. Jonah Jameson's office wearing a Spider-Man costume and the real Spider-Man asks the receptionist, does that happen often? She says, yeah, everyone's coming out of the woodworks claiming to be Spider-Man and cash in on the money. That one looks more like Ant-Man than Spider-Man though. Jonah then shouts asking Peter, what do you want? Cause your school take your lunch money again? Peter walks in telling him, looks like someone finally found that nickel they were looking for. And what's with your crazy Spider-Man stunt? Isn't this the 11th time you pulled the old cash reward for Spider-Man's identity thing? Jonah says, who cares? Some anonymous billionaire donates $5 million to boost our circulation? Who am I to say no? What are you doing here anyway, Paka? Peter tells him, well, I took some photos of Doc Ock escaping and figured you'd want them. Jonah tells him, why would I want that amateur crap? Besides, how long was Doc Ock out for? Five minutes, he didn't kill anyone. Just then, Jonah's son John walks in asking if he's ready to get some lunch. Hey Peter, how's it going? Peter tells him, not bad. Just trying to squeeze a little cash out of your old man. Jonah grabs his coat, telling him, look, Paca, I know about how you and the wife got a few debt problems. I'll give you 500 for the photos. Peter asks, wait, how did you know about that? And Jonah calls back, ex-supermodel has her Macy's checks bounced by the bank. It's tomorrow's front page, kiddo. But something doesn't sit right with Peter. Some billionaire donates $5 million to give him grief. A short while later, Spider-Man visits Norman with Norman's back turned to him. And Spider-Man tells him, we both know I'm dangling here. Stop trying to annoy me. Norman continues on his puzzle, telling him, annoying you is the only pleasure I get, Parker. What do you want? Spider-Man tells him, see if I can shed a little light on what happened to May. I've gone over everything and come up with nothing. Maybe I'm just too normal to see what this guy is up to. Maybe you could figure out why this guy hasn't gotten in touch in the last few days. Norman slams against the glass, telling Spider-Man, Ask again! Ask why I should help after being locked up and endangering my life! Spider-Man stops and says, What do you mean endangering? This is a high security cell. Your skin is practically bulletproof. Norman leans in. You should ask yourself this. What were they doing to Otto? Why are all of my offices being burglarized right now? With no other lead, Spider-Man heads to Xavier's Institute for Mutant Kind to speak with Rachel Summers to try and see if speaking with a telepath might help. The second they sit down though, Rachel begins to see things. She begins to see the night of the attack and it was violent. She had just moved into the apartment and she chained the door, but it didn't matter. The man snapped the chain and pushed his way in and she passed out, but she knew him. She knew who took her, but he's different now. He's not human anymore, huh? Oh God, Aunt May was so scared. Spider-Man shouts asking, who? Who did this? Was it Venom? Was it Eddie Brock? Rachel says that she can't see his face. And Spider-Man stands up yelling, think harder. She begins to cry and Spider-Man asks, what is it? 
and Rachel tells him that she's not sure that he wants to hear this, but she thinks Aunt May is dead. Meanwhile, elsewhere, supervillains from across the city begin to gather up at an unknown location for an auction, a very special auction. Tinkerer welcomes everyone, telling them that they have something that they've never seen before. He's here to offer up a costume like none other. Ladies and gentlemen, tonight's auction is for Venom himself. Sandman shouts, that ain't Venom. And Tinkerer says, no, of course not. This gentleman is Eddie Brock, Venom's human host. Unfortunately for Eddie, he has cancer and is on a limited timeline. Eddie has had a crisis of faith and is ready to suffer the consequences for his illness. Mysterio then says, that doesn't sound very holy-like. What is Eddie going to do with the money? Donate it to charity? And Eddie tells him, that's exactly what I'm going to do. That piece of trash would only find a new host anyway. Might as well put some dirty money to good use. Venom then projects himself over Eddie. And Tinkerfer tells everyone, it seems that we are ready. Let's start the bidding at $10 million. For two weeks, the city has now been silent. Spider-Man goes out of patrol and calls Black Cat asking if she's found anything. And Black Cat says that she did find out something interesting. The lead that she was tracking a few weeks ago turned out to be an auction. Don Fortunato won said auction and paid quite a bit for it. Spider-Man asks what was the merchandise and Black Cat tells him, well, you're not gonna believe this, but it was for Venom. Apparently Brock's gone all religious and Fortunato broke the bank stating that he just wanted to make something of his little nebbish son, Angelo, who's always followed him around. Spider-Man says, it's just one cycle becoming another cycle. It's all the same these days. Any word on Aunt May? Is she linked to any of this? Black Cat tells him that she's sorry, but it doesn't look like Venom had anything to do with the kidnapping. So Spider-Man sighs as he hangs up, swinging down to the local diner to use the men's room. When he finishes washing his hands, the waitress behind the counter shouts at him and points to the sign. Restrooms are for paying customers only. Can't you read? He asks if she's serious and the waitress says, do I look like I've got a good sense of humor? Tonight's special is key lime pie and coffee for $2.99. Spider-Man looks at the woman's name tag and says, uh, no thanks, Ramona, just coffee's fine. So Spider-Man drinks his coffee and he asks, didn't this place used to be a lot busier? There's no one here. Ramona sighs stating, yeah, but I can't move into day shifts because I have a special needs child and it looks like we may be closing this shift altogether. I really can't pay for daycare. I'll just have to find some way to manage. So Spider-Man tells her, yeah, I'm a bit strapped for cash myself. And Ramona tells him not to worry about it. But the two of them have a mutual friend. Remember Adrian Toomes? Spider-Man asks, are you talking about the Vulture? And Ramona tells him, yeah. She knows the two of them aren't exactly drinking buddies, but it would seem like a coincidence worth mentioning. She dated his son a few years back. Adrian's the grandfather to her little boy that she was talking about. And that's when it hits him. Her son is the child Vulture was talking about, the one who had leukemia that he was trying to get money for. He said that he would pay for the half a million operation with some nest egg he put away. But he hasn't been around for the past few weeks. No matter what, though, we know he isn't going to let us down. Spider-Man starts to feel bad. He ended all of that. He put Vulture away. The sirens go off in the distance, and he says that it sounds like that's his cue. How much do I owe? Ramona tells him to forget about it. Did he really think that she was going to charge a superhero for a cup of coffee? Go out there and fight the good fight, Spider-Man. So he heads out, and over at the Our Lady of Saints Church, Eddie meets with Don Fortunato and his son to hand over the symbiote. Don says that he's sorry it took so long to get the money together, and Eddie tells him, no, it's fine. It's not like I could really go anywhere myself with it. The money's going to a good cause. Don tells him, yeah, though he's glad to be able to use Venom's muscle for the family business and to this little runt his wife brought into the world. Eddie pulls Angelo aside and asks, are you sure about this? This is a pretty nasty beast to be carrying around. Angelo tells him, I'm 5'9 and 110 pounds. The only girls that talk to me are the ones that my dad rents every birthday and Christmas. What am I throwing away here? Besides, Venom puts me up there with the likes of Magneto and Dr. Doom. Eddie takes off his jacket telling him, all right, just wanted to make sure. And Don asks, is it true that Venom knows Spider-Man's secret identity? Eddie looks up at the cross telling him, yeah. And if you ask nicely, Venom might just tell you. Back on the other side of town, Spider-Man decides to have a night to himself when Mary Jane says that their high school reunion is the same night. He walks through the halls, seeing his old friends. And just before he takes a group photo, his spider sense goes off. He pushes everyone away, and that's the moment that Venom bursts through the wall tackling Spider-Man. As Spider-Man is thrown, he catches himself yelling, Eddie needs to stop or he's gonna hurt innocent people. And Angelo tells him, Eddie doesn't live here anymore. You're talking to Angelo Fortunato. And I'm here to make a name for myself. One survivor of the break-in gets up asking Peter Parker, are you Spider-Man? But before anyone can answer anything, Angela grabs that man's head, crushing it. And Venom shouts asking, where were we? Spider-Man jumps off the wall, knocking Angela through the wall while quickly putting on his costume, asking, you want to do this? Let's do this. 
Venom leaps back, pulling Spider-Man through a wall. And as everyone sees, Mary Jane rushes over to tell everyone that they need to evacuate the building. Spider-Man attempts to web up Angelo, but Angelo catches it midair, telling him, It's like sitting in a slow motion. He flings the web, flinging Spider-Man out of the building, following up by almost stomping on his head. Spider-Man fights back, telling him, You must be a real disappointment. A hundred million dollars and you're still a freaking loser. Your dad must be real proud. As the two fight, they end up in the middle of the road right in the way of a speeding fuel truck. Spider-Man quickly grabs the dog that ran towards them and then lets the truck crash into Venom. But as he watches, Angelo starts to pick up another passing truck and he throws it at him. Spider-Man jumps off the building through the windshield, grabbing the man and flying out the back before hitting the wall. Venom leaves up into the air to escape, but Spider-Man chases him, shouting, Just give it up! I can smell a geek from a mile away! And Venom is not you! Spider-Man jumps after him, and just before grabbing him, Angelo uses Venom's cloaking ability and vanishes. Spider-Man lands on a building, yelling, The man you killed is never coming back! Do you really want to be remembered for killing a bystander? Venom reappears behind him, telling him, No! I want to be known as the man who killed Spider-Man! Angelo pulls his arm back, punching Spider-Man into his back so hard that he punches through his spine and ribs. He then takes his arm back out, holding Spider-Man's heart, shouting, I did it! I did what Green Goblin, Doctor Doom, Doctor Octopus could never do! I killed Spider-Man! But in the shadows, a man with a camera quietly says, This wasn't supposed to happen. He promised this wouldn't happen. Angelo looks over, asking, And who the hell are you? Spider-Man reappears, punching Angelo into a wall and then into a water container. Angelo tries to get back up, but Spider-Man punches him again and again until Angelo finally shouts, I give up! Spider-Man webs up a pile of bricks, swinging them around, knocking Angelo through the air. Venom himself then speaks up, Angelo's weak! You're a disappointment. The problem with you is you don't have enough Venom in you. Venom jumps off the ledge of the building with Angelo, separating himself, leaving Angelo to fall to the street. Spider-Man yells for him to relax his body, but Angelo doesn't hear him, and he lands face first into the pavement. But this isn't the only death tonight. Elsewhere, Eddie was found with his wrists opened up. He tried to be good. He tried to make up for all those horrible things he did, but now he might not make it through the night. This is why the hunt for Spider-Man must end. There's only one way to do it. The next morning, Peter heads to the Daily Bugle and tells Jonah that he has it. He has Spider-Man's identity. If he could, he'd like to tell him alone. Jonah asks, what is this about? Why wouldn't you want to put that menace's face out for the public? Peter hands over photos of Spider-Man, but it isn't Peter Parker. It's John Jameson, Jonah's son. Jonah sits down. No, uh, of course not, my own son. What about the prize money? Peter tells him, oh no, I, I don't want any. But Jonah hands him a briefcase with half a million telling him, this is all you get. The rest sits in a private offshore account. But before you ask for the full amount, the answer is no. I'll just go. I, this is a lot that I have to think about. Peter leaves with the money, but he knows he doesn't deserve it. Or maybe he does. Maybe he deserves a little good luck for once. But the money doesn't belong to him, and if he gives it back, Jonah will definitely know that something's up. So what is a superhero supposed to do with half a million dollars? Donate it to someone who could actually use the money. Someone like Ramona. A few days after the attack at the school reunion, Spider-Man and Mary Jane visit the police station to give their statements about what happened. And just as the detective begins his questioning, Spider-Man's phone rings. The man on the phone says that that was an interesting way to spend the money that he gave Jonah. But what about Eddie? It's a shame to lose a colleague like that, but he just didn't fit into the plans that they have for the new and improved rogues gallery. Spider-Man quietly tells the man that he's going to kill him for this. He's going to hunt him down for murdering his aunt. And the man laughs. <laughs> Let's not get ahead of ourselves. There's a lot of people involved here. To tell you the truth, this is just the tip of the iceberg. What were the cops doing to Otto Octavius? Why is Osborne in such terrible danger? And why has dear old Aunt May been integral to all of these plans? We'll meet for lunch tomorrow, and the whole story will be laid out. Ciao for now, Peter. As the sidewalks of New York fill with busy lunchgoers, Spider-Man pushes his way through the crowds when he notices a man seemingly out of place hiding his face. He stops and the man asks if he's surprised to see him. Spider-Man asks, what? The man goes on stating that it must be a shock to see him as the kidnapper, right? Truth be told, he was scared the voice would give him away in the phone. Spider-Man stares at him for a moment and asks, do we know each other? The man then asks, are you joking? Am I some second stinger now? I have to tell you? You should know who I am! Scorpion! Mac Gargan! Without even saying a word, Spider-Man lunges forward, slamming Scorpion into the window, stating, I am this close to breaking your neck! 
Scorpion stops him, telling him, Now those are some fancy moves. Why don't you just go out and show everyone who you are? But if you want to keep the old hag alive, you better get control of that little temper of yours. Spider-Man shouts, Prove she's alive! So Scorpion asks, Are you really in any place to make demands? Now put me down before I get ticked off and walk away. Spider-Man loosens his grip, setting Scorpion down, and Scorpion tells him, Good boy! Now let's get some lunch and discuss what you're going to do for me. As the two sit for lunch, Spider-Man asks, How long have you known? And Scorpion asks, Your secret identity? Coming up in a year this Christmas. Spider-Man then asks, If you've known for that long, why did you keep it secret? And why give the Daily Bugle five million? Scorpion laughs. <laughs> you really don't have a clue, huh? Who do you think hired me? This is all Norman's masterpiece, kid. The Green Goblin's Revenge. You see, Norman had everything set up that if he was ever arrested or publicly exposed, this little game of yours would be cranked up to a notch or two. Spider-Man tells him, that doesn't make any sense. If Norman was behind this, why was he so scared back at Rikers? Scorpion tells him, because your aunt is just the tip of the iceberg. You ever wonder why you've always been fighting the same guys over and over again? May Parker is just an insurance policy. The real meat and potatoes of this is what's been going on in the background all of these years. Imagine it's 1945. You're one of the richest men on the planet. Girls, money, power, the American dream. And then these guys in masks show up, righting wrongs and throwing their superpowers around. After a while, they'll begin to snoop, and when they do, suddenly that American dream crumbles and they see what you're up to. So what do the people in the background do when they're faced with the people that can just walk through bullets? Easy. They create the super bad guy. Now most of the villains back in the day were just ex-GIs on salaries. And these people, they were assigned to the heroes. It was in their contracts. There was only one or two organizations for each hero, and that's all you really need. Once you get the ball rolling, you just sit back and enjoy the fun. Take last month's auction. People were bleeding themselves dry to become an A-list villain. Spider-Man throws his hands up. This is garbage. There's no way the government would create their own supervillains. And Scorpion tells him, that's where you're wrong. It isn't the government. It's the companies who put the governments in office, and neutralizing the capes was a genuine business concern. Spider-Man asks, What does any of this have to do with Norman? Scorpion tells him, Really? He's a billionaire, a biochemist, all of those big military contracts. Norman Osborn was their favorite supervillain contractor until he went a little nuts with the Green Goblin thing. Bush and Clinton found out about this, and they closed down any supervillain programs that they heard of. But there were some very famous names in the original Cabal. That's why they want to kill Norman. He knows where all the bodies are buried. And Norman locked up in jail is the very definition of a loose cannon. As long as he's in his cell, he's a sitting duck for any would-be assassin. Spider-Man then says, If I was going to believe that any of this was true, why has Norman been locked up for over three months and no attempts on his life been made? Scorpion tells him, It's because Norman has plans on top of plans. Anything happens to him, emails and parcels will start reaching out to media outlets. Why do you think Oscorp has had so many break-ins lately? These guys can't pull the trigger until they cover their bases. Hell, ever wonder what happened to Doc Ock? He's been brainwashed to kill Norman. His next scheduled attempt is this weekend. That's why we need your help. Norman Osborn wants Spider-Man to break him out of prison tomorrow at midnight. Spider-Man tells him, no, no way, forget it. And Scorpion tells him, oh, so Aunt May's gonna die then, simple as that. Sure, you're breaking the Green Goblin out, and there's always a possibility that he's going to kill someone, but refuse, and there's a guarantee that May Parker's going to die. Spider-Man slams his hand on the table, asking, Why are you doing this? Why go to all this trouble? It's because you raised the ante by putting Norman behind bars. You only got yourself to blame for this, kid. Now, if you excuse me, there's a new Scorpion suit waiting to be picked up that Norman arranged for me. Spider-Man tells him, I don't care about any of that stuff. I'm not going to break Norman out of prison. Scorpion walks off. Sure you are, because you've already buried enough friends over the years, right? Later that night, Scorpion heads back to his apartment to try on his new suit, but just before he does, a voice tells him that that new suit is to die for. Scorpion asks who there, and the voice tells him, Your new best friend! We're your ticket out of the gutter. Scorpion tells him, Yeah, not interested, already have enough friends. Venom looms out of the shadows, telling him, Sure, but you've never had a friend like me! Meanwhile, over at Spider-Man's apartment, Mary Jane throws up in the sink, shouting that he can't be serious. He's gonna break somebody like that out of prison? And that somebody is Green Goblin? Spider-Man tells him, It's what Scorpion said. There's always a risk of Norman hurting someone, but if I do nothing, Aunt May will die. Mary Jane begins to cry, stating, Norman is using you! He's pulling strings and making you dance like an idiot. Don't do this. Pete, Norman's too smart. 
Spider-Man hugs her, telling her, Things are different now. Dr. Octopus is brainwashed to kill him, and he's vulnerable for the first time in his life. Norman promised that he'd behave. I have reason to believe that Norman is too scared to be lying this time. Besides, there's no other way to save Aunt May. As Spider-Man and Black Cat leave, Mary Jane watches in the windows and reaches into her robe, pulling out a gun. She sits down. Please, God, let me be wrong about all of this. Later at Rikers Island, Black Cat and Spider-Man sneak in with Spider-Man asking, How's it going over there? Black Cat holds up a flashlight in her mouth, stating that they're all set. Security cameras are paused across the route that Scorpion laid out for them. They got roughly 20 minutes. As Spider-Man gets to Norman's cell, he asks Black Cat if she can get a little light in there. A second later, Norman's cell lights up with him standing there, stating that he's 90 seconds behind the schedule. Spider-Man deactivates the lock, telling him to just shut up before I change my mind about this. A short while later, in the tunnels of the prison, a worker notices three people coming towards him, and he asks, who the heck are they? The worker calls out that they have a breakout in Delta Tunnel. Tell the CEOs that, before the man could finish, Norman tackles him and starts running. Spider-Man and Black Cat go after him, but just as Spider-Man reaches to help the man up that Norman knocked over, officers run over shouting, freeze. Spider-Man tries to tell them it's okay, but the officers open fire, forcing Spider-Man to dive underwater. He begins to swim back to the mainland, but that's when he notices a jet stream swirling around him, and that jet stream crashes into him, shooting him out of the water, slamming him into the ground. Hydra-Man starts to form up asking, what's the matter, swallow a little water? And Spider-Man shouts, you idiot, what are you doing here? Hydra-Man tells him, I'm making 50 grand an hour, just like Sandman's trying to capture Black Cat over there. Black Cat says that she's sorry, one of them she can handle, but Norman is now in his Green Goblin costume, flying by on his glider, stating, please spare him. And Spider-Man shouts asking, what is this? Norman tells him, you know exactly what this is. Did you think that this wasn't going to be a double cross? Spider-Man yells, please! Hey, I kept my end of the bargain! Just tell me where Aunt May is! Norman says, I appreciate it, kid. I really do. But I got a super criminal reputation to think of. So what are you boys waiting for? Take care of Spider-Man while I dance off with his wife. Electro steps out telling Norman, You should call us what you were talking about earlier! And Norman tells him, The Sinister Twelve did have a curious appeal about it. Just a shame Scorpion never appeared. While the villains start to surround Spider-Man, Scorpion then does appear, wearing the Venom suit, stating, This was supposed to be Spider-Man's last stand! I wouldn't miss it for the world! Norman flies over asking, What is this? It wasn't part of the plan! These plots are planned in phenomenal detail! You becoming Venom had nothing to do with it, Scorpion! The Scorpion asks, Really? You're completely overreacting here! All I've done is made myself more powerful! This could only be good for the plan! While Norman bickers about his plan, Spider-Man kicks Sandman back, telling Black Cat, Hit him while Norman's distracted! As Spider-Man jumps from person to person, Chameleon shouts, asking, Can anyone hit this clown? Scorpion jumps off the building into Spider-Man, stating, Relax! I'm on it! Black Cat turns to help, but Electro shocks her, telling her, Don't even think about it! And Vulture yells, Hey, I was supposed to get first crack at Black Cat for what she did to my face. Shocker tells him, why not just take it out on Spider-Man? He's the one who lost your grandson's money. All the villains start shouting which one should have their turn first, and that's when Scorpion grabs Spider-Man, asking, You yeah, hear that? Everyone wants a piece of you, and you know what? They're going to get it. We're going to carve our names into your corpse and hang it up on a flagpole. When we're finished with you, you're going to die here tonight. Norman's orders right here, right now, and you know what else? That pretty little redhead at home is gonna die too. Spider-Man screams, knocking Scorpion away, and the second he gets up, Hydra-Man blasts him into the back, knocking him back down. The villains all take their turns getting in their shots, and while this is happening, a shadowy figure tells his team, get ready. Captain America jumps into the light, shouting, all right, take them down. But back at the apartment, Mary Jane sighs, stating that she's sorry she had to make that call. Norman is going to screw him over. He is going to betray Pete. And from the darkness, Norman appears telling her, Oh, you're a clever girl. Now it's time for you to go to sleep. Back on the coastline, though, Spider-Man yells, I have to get out of here! My wife is... But Cap stops him. Just go! We have these creeps under control. Spider-Man webs up, flinging himself into the air, but before he can get far, Scorpion tackles him mid-swing, sending the two of them into a nearby building. Spider-Man begins fighting back, listening to Scorpion taunt him, but Spider-Man just focuses on his punches, and that's when he notices Scorpion firing out the suit in a hundred different directions. As the web is cast, Scorpion tells him, I'm not here to kill you, just keep you busy while Norman kills Mary Jane. 
Spider-Man thinks to himself that Scorpion wouldn't do this. He couldn't do this. And as Scorpion pulls back on the strands, he rips apart all of the buildings that he's connected to, bringing them all down onto the street. Spider-Man's hands move faster than they ever have before, firing off his web, and right when he's done, a giant spider web covers the entire street, holding back the debris. Everyone on the street shouts to Spider-Man to kick that guy's butt for them. So Spider-Man says, that sounds like a plan. He begins punching Scorpion over and over, and he fires more webs with Scorpion laughing. <laughs> you missed. As Scorpion looks back, he sees Spider-Man has webbed up an old abandoned building and he begins to pull down on it. The entire building comes crashing down on Scorpion and Spider-Man quickly turns back asking everyone, are you guys okay? The crowd cheers yelling, hell yeah, we're okay. We were just saved by Spider-Man. So he rushes off without saying another word. And as he swings by the bridge, he sees something. He calls out asking if that's Mary Jane and he sees Norman Osborn holding her body over the ledge, asking, Hey, this look familiar, kid? Spider-Man shouts, You've already killed on May! Isn't that enough? And Norman laughs, <laughs> You have so little faith! Aunt May's just been placed under a deep, deep sleep for the last few months. In about 45 minutes, she's gonna run out of air and choke in her own vomit, but she's hardly among the dead men yet. Tick tock, tick tock, Spider-Man! The stakes are especially high tonight, aren't they? And you only have yourself to blame. Spider-Man yells, asking, What do I have to do? And Norman tells him, We'll pick up where we left off when I escaped from the cage. You forfeiting your own life in exchange for the life of an innocent. Spider-Man shouts, asking, What is the point of all of this? Why, Norman? Norman flies around, telling him, Because heroes need villains to keep them in check. And that's when the two of them hear a clanking sound. They look back to see Doc Ock climbing up the side of the building, his metal arms lunging for Norman, causing him to drop Mary Jane. And all Doc Ock can say is, Kill Norman Osborn. Kill Norman Osborn by midnight tonight. While Norman begins to throw his pumpkin bombs at Doc Ock, Spider Man webs up Norman's glider, slamming him into the bridge. Mary Jane calls out to Spider Man, but when he looks away, Norman grabs him by the throat and begins to squeeze. Norman tells him, It doesn't matter who wins here tonight. We both know that we will both rise from the grave and do this all over again. It's what supervillains are supposed to do. As Norman puts Spider-Man down, Mary Jane yells to him, taking out her gun and opening fire. The bullets bounce off of Norman, but the recoil from the gun throws Mary Jane off balance and she stumbles, falling off the ledge. Spider-Man runs to the edge, shooting out his webs, making sure to be careful where he hits Mary Jane so that she does not suffer the same fate as Gwen Stacy. Norman gets back up asking, Do you think you're getting a happy ending here? 30 minutes until Aunt May's oxygen runs out. He lifts the glider over his head, but that's when a metal arm reaches out grabbing him. Doc Ock shouts, Osborne, got to kill Osborne. So Norman turns his attention to Doc Ock, but before he can slam the glider down, lightning strikes the glider, electrocuting both of them. They both fall over the ledge and into the river below. Mary Jane asks, What about May? Spider-Man tells her that he's failed. Soon she'll be dead and she could be anywhere in this city. She could be. But that's when he stops and he shouts, I know where she is! Stay here! He hurries over to Aunt Ben's grave, rethinking all of the things that Scorpion and Norman said. Don't you think you've buried enough friends? May's just been sleeping. Soon she'll run out of oxygen. She's hardly among the dead men. As Spider-Man rips open the coffin, he sees Aunt May sleeping there, peacefully. He reaches down, pulling her out and he tells himself that he's going to kill Norman for this. Aunt May's too old and frail for this. And lightning strikes again with her coughing, asking, Peter? The next morning, Cap and his team search the river only to find the body of Doc Ock with no sign of Norman. Black Cat checks into the hospital under a false name, but the doctors tell her that she's going to be fine. Scorpion was taken away, and the Tinkerer made sure to auction off his new suit. Everything begins to feel right with the world, but as Spider-Man looks over the bridge, he begins to feel sorry for himself. Aunt May walks up stating that Mary Jane said that he would be here. The man they sold their house to said that he would rent it to them for next to nothing. Plus, with them selling the apartment, they have more than enough money to cover all of the debts thanks to the housing market going up in the past few months. So, what's wrong? Spider-Man begins to cry, telling her that he's sorry, that she has to move back into that old rundown house. He should have been looking after her. He should have been making more money. He was supposed to be smart. May tells him that he is smart. He's the smartest boy that she's ever met. He's doing a job that means a lot more than just making money. He's shaping the future for children to be their best. Not to mention everything he does as Spider-Man. He laughs. <laughs> All Spider-Man does is sell newspapers. I haven't done anything of real significance. She tells him it's not true. He saves lives. Tens of thousands of lives. On what planet is that 
and significant. She hands Peter a bag with his costume, stating that he needs to make sure that he's warm under those clothes with all this bad weather that New York's been having lately. So if he wants to stop being silly, how about they go home and eat some wheat cakes? They should be done right about now. But elsewhere, a letter is being sent. One from Norman as a part of his many, many plans. The letter tells Peter that even though they've had their differences, he still respects him in the highest regard. That even though they fight constantly, there's never really been any real enmity between them. If it wasn't for Spider-Man, he would just be another boring businessman running another boring chemical manufacturing company. Be sure to take care and rest well as he prays for him. Signed, Norman Osborn. I hope you guys enjoyed today's full story. On this channel, we re-upload our full stories from the Comic Story and Main channel. That way, if you just only want full stories, you have a channel that delivers those to you. If you enjoy this, please consider liking and subscribing, and please consider checking out our main channel to see the more up-to-date things. I'll see you guys next time right here.